Today, I will be describing how to create heat maps for single case design data using GraphPad Prism. If you haven't already, please open GraphPad Prism. Under New Table and Graph, select XY, choose numbers for your X axis, and select the first option for Y. Enter and plot a single Y value for each data point, then click Create. On the left side of the prism window, double click data one under data tables to assign a more descriptive name to your data table. For example, scatter plot of problem behavior. This will automatically change the name of the corresponding graph. The first column in your data table reflects your y-axis data labels, for example, the times of day from 9 to 3 p.m. The first row depicts your x-axis labels, such as dates like May 1st, May 2nd. You can click on any of these cells to enter alphanumeric data. For each x-y coordinate, such as A1, Enter a value that will display as a particular color in the heat map. For categorical variables, enter numerical values that correspond to categories like 0, 1, and 2 for colors that might depict no problem behavior, low levels of problem behavior, and high levels of problem behavior, white, gray, and black tiles. For continuous variables, enter the raw or transformed numerical values such as rates of 0, 1.2, and 4.2 problem behaviors per minute, and the heat map will automatically assign colors based on the range of values. For the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to enter some mock data that could be used as either categorical or continuous data. For both categorical and continuous variables, you have the option to leave cells blank in place of a category, such as leaving a cell that says zero blank to automatically turn it white in place of entering a zero to make it white, which might be easy for data sets where there are not a ton of occurrences of behavior and you just simply want to mark occurrence or non-occurrence. So you might just enter ones in a scatter plot where problem behavior did occur. The other thing that you could do, regardless of whether your data set depicts categorical or continuous variables, is to right click any of the cells and exclude the values. You could also hit Control E on a Windows computer. And you'll see that the cell changes here to indicate it's being excluded. This might be relevant for outlier data points or data points that you might not want to include, for example, ones that had treatment integrity errors during those cases. For now, we're going to include all of our data. Next, after you finalize the data table, under graphs, select scatter plot with problem behavior. Under change graph type, the new window that's created, select column under graph family, and instead choose grouped, then choose heat map. You can see there are a wide array of different color schematic options for your graph. For the purpose of this, where we're teaching how to create ones for publication, we're gonna select a heat map that is grayscale and select OK. Now double click anywhere on the graph to open the format graph window. This window has six tabs that allow you to customize the vast majority of the aspects related to the heat map. I'm going to pull this over to the side here so we can see the changes that correspond in the graph. The color mapping tab is where you can change the type of gradient, including color patterns, and switch between continuous and categorical depictions of your data. Under color map, you can change the color schematics of your graph 
as well as switch it to categorical, which we'll do momentarily. Under range, you can select a color that corresponds with your largest and smallest values. And which one you choose for grayscale might depend on what variable you're using. In our case, because often we want to highlight more severe instances of problem behavior, we're gonna choose black for the largest value and white for the smallest value. You can also change the overall range of your values. So for example, if you have a large data set, you might want to choose values that are perhaps above a certain criterion. For example, above 1.0 in terms of rate of problem behavior. Thus, you could adjust the range by selecting custom. For now, we'll keep everything on auto. Additionally, you can choose to mark outlier data points with specific colors. This isn't as conducive to grayscale options given the limited range of color choices, but can be helpful for traditional heat maps that have various colors. For example, they might have greens and reds, and so you could select a yellow color for an outlier. You can also mark blank or excluded values with a specific color and more conducive to grayscale options. You can select this box to place an X in those cells, which might be useful to depict omitted data. Let's take a look at what this might look like for categorical variables. Under color map, switch from grayscale to categorical. You can see that each row denotes a category. You can organize data into categories by entering a sig single value, such as zero, or a range of values, such as zero to one. For this, we're going to select a single value. Then you can modify the color and add a label, such as no problem behavior. We'll do this for the remaining values in our data set. As with the continuous variables, you can mark other values and blank or excluded values in the same way. Let's click apply to see what this looks like in a categorical framework. You can see that the legend also changes to reflect the categorical nature. For now, I'm going to go back to grayscale and click apply for a continuous variable. Next, let's click on Graph Settings. The Graph Settings tab is where you can change the appearance of the overall graph and the tiles, referred to as cells by Prism. We recommend keeping the page transparent. You can add in white or other backgrounds later when you export the image in Prism. The cell borders create a tile outline. We select half to one point usually as a sufficient thickness. Although we don't recommend a heat map border in most cases, which puts this border around the entire set of tiles, make sure you have this selected so you could switch the thickness from one to a lower thickness, such as half point, and click apply. This is relevant because the heat map border alters the thickness of the tick marks across the X and Y axes. If you do retain the heat map border, you can choose to offset it, such as by 0.2. And you can see that the border is slightly offset. Now we'll take the heat map borders off, so we retain the changes for the tick marks, but we get rid of that larger border around the entire heat map. Next, you can choose to specify the size of the tiles or the entire graph which will size tiles automatically. We recommend using square cells. Usually Prism does a pretty good job of programming an appropriate aspect ratio for the tiles when selecting the set size of heat map. So we'll stick with this option. The first checkbox under order will flip your X values. 
The second checkbox will flip your Y values. And the third checkbox will flip your X and Y axes or transpose your data. Next, let's click on the Titles tab. The Titles tab allows you to add graph labels. The graph title allows you to add a heading for the entire graph. We recommend omitting this. You could select Row Labels Title to add a Y axis label, and Columns Label Title to add an X axis label. We'll get to modify these labels here in a minute. Next, let's click on the Labels tab. The Labels tab allows you to customize your tick marks and labels, as well as displaying values of each tile. By selecting Label Each Cell with its value, it allows you to see the specific value that produced the shading in the heat map. Row Labels allows you to customize your Y-axis labels. Under Label, we'll select Row Titles, which adds the times from our data table. And typically, Prism is pretty good about labeling appropriately and selecting the automatic function. But just to be safe, we'll select every row to make sure that all the times are listed there. For larger amounts of data on the y-axis, you might choose automatic or selecting a different option. Column labels allows you to change the tick labels for the x-axis. Again, under Label, we'll choose to source to our data table or column titles. And here's a case where we want to see each date, so we'll select every column. You can see that it's undesirable how these labels are contacting one another. So under Label, instead of Horizontal, we'll select Angled, or 45 degrees. Next, let's go to the Gaps tab. The Gaps tab allows you to efficiently break apart the columns and rows of the heat map. Selecting vertical gaps allows you to create spaces between your columns of tiles. In general, we recommend using Prism's default for your graph as it's pretty good about providing sufficient space that's not excessive. You can also select adding additional spacing to groups of columns which is helpful for depicting phase changes. You can use some of the programmed options listed here, or select which column you would like extra spacing after. Another nice feature is that you could select a line to be programmed into that gap. This is helpful for depicting phase changes in single case data, such as these three columns depicting baseline and these two depicting your intervention. For now, I'm going to remove these extra gaps. The horizontal gap feature allows you to create spaces between your rows of tiles. Again, we recommend the default spacing here. And you can also choose to add some additional spacing, which might be helpful for grouping rows together. For example, breaking apart the morning and the evening during the day. Just like with above, you can also draw in a line for a more salient break between your rows of data. Now let's click on the Legend tab. The Legend tab allows you to adjust the legend that anchors your heat map colors to your values. Your orientation allows you to select where on page that your legend appears. You could have it vertically here, horizontally, or it's underneath. Which you could also adjust to be above your graph. And what you choose here might depend on what your dependent variable is and what makes sense relative to your data. For now, we're going to select vertical orientation. And like we've mentioned before, we'll select half point thickness. You can change the interval of the scaling here. We'll keep this at 0.5, starting at zero. You can also reverse the legend direction if for your DV, it makes sense to have the minimum at the top. 
As with some of the other axis and tick customization in the format graph window, you can adjust various aspects of the tick mark itself and how it appears on the graph. For now, we'll keep this the same. Same with the numbers and labels. When you're all done customizing your heat map, you can go ahead and click OK. Although the graph will look nearly complete, there are some components that still require adjustment. You can click on any of the text to alter it. I'm going to select the bolding feature to turn off the bolding of the axis labels. Next, I'm going to select the label title so I can enter my Y axis label and click back anywhere on the graph to make that change. I'll do the same for the X axis. Finally, there's no automatic label for the legend. So what I'm going to do is right click and insert text. which you can, again, adjust in a variety of ways. For now, I'm just going to right-click and center the justification here and drag it. So now you're all done with your heat map and you are ready to export. If you'd like to export, you can click somewhere on the graph page and right-click, select export. You could choose from a variety of different file formats based on whether you are exporting for presentation, publication, etc. Generally, we suggest using a JPEG at the highest DPI possible or using an EPS or PDF for publication. Good luck with your heat maps and please reach out if you have any questions or concerns.